What if I told you the most powerful economies in the world don't rise or fall on oil anymore but on rocks? Not just any rocks. Minerals so small most people have never heard of them. But they're buried deep in your smartphone, your electric car, our fighter jets, even the satellites circling the planet right now. Rare earth minerals. They power the chips inside AI, the magnets inside missiles, the batteries inside Teslas. They are the invisible fuel of modern life and the United States doesn't control them, China does. We only hear a little about these minerals on the news. We don't see them in headlines, but they are the backbone of every emerging technology on the planet. Without them, entire industries stall, and America falls behind. And if China decides to flip the switch to stop exporting what we need most, we need a backup. I'm about to tell a big chunk of the story, but it ain't over yet. So take a quick second and tap subscribe. And if you would be so kind, give this video a like. This is bigger than trade, bigger than tariffs. This is about the materials that shape the future and who gets to build it. Rare earth minerals aren't flashy. They don't sparkle like gold or shine like silver, but they're more important than either. These minerals are made up of 17 elements pulled from the earth. Names like neodymium, dysprosium, and terbium. Most people can't even pronounce them. But if you've used a smartphone, driven a hybrid car, or streamed a movie, you've used them. Neodymium is used in magnets that power electric vehicles, wind turbines, and headphones. Lanthanum helps make the camera lenses in your phone. Cerium, well, it polishes glass. Dysprosium helps guide missiles. Yttrium and europium are what turn your flat screen into a window to Hollywood. They're what turn raw tech into real-world power. And the process to get them? First they're mined, usually tangled up with a bunch of other junk, then comes the refining, that's where the magic happens, also where the mess happens. It's dirty, toxic, complicated, and expensive. So of course, we outsourced it. Here's the part that makes politicians sweat. The United States has rare minerals, but we don't process them. China does. They spent decades building the infrastructure to refine this stuff while we argued about TikTok and debated whether we could afford to mine in Nevada without hurting a beetle. Now, China refines over 90% of the world's rare earth minerals, including the ones we dig up. We dig it, we ship it, they refine it, we buy it back. It's like growing your own coffee beans, handing them to your neighbor to grind, and they charge you for a pot of coffee. But you want coffee, and they have the only grinder so you pay. And if China decides to stop grinding that coffee, we've got a bunch of coffee beans with nothing to drink. This has already happened. In 2010, China cut off rare mineral exports to Japan over a political dispute. For two straight months, no press conference, no warning, just off, just to show they could. 90% of their rare earth supply came from China at the time. No diversified sources, no real backup plan, China knew Japan needed those minerals for tech, defense, and manufacturing, and used it to apply pressure during the Senkaku Islands dispute. Japan wasn't prepared. They didn't have domestic stockpiles or strong secondary trade routes lined up yet. It was a flex, a warning shot. Japan had to back off diplomatically and scramble to lock down new rare earth deals afterward, which they did. They didn't panic, they pivoted, fast. They started stockpiling, cut deals with Australia, India, and Vietnam, invested in rare earth recycling. They made sure that stunt could never work again. China showed their hand to Japan, but we saw it too. If they pull that again, we could be the ones stuck on hold with customer service while every factory from Tesla to Raytheon slams into a wall. We do have leverage to get us through the meantime, and the United States is throwing some money at it. Companies like MP Materials are trying to build domestic processing. But the Department of Defense and Department of Energy both want more funding for domestic processing and mining. When the cameras are on, lawmakers say the same thing. This is a national security issue. Both parties say it's critical. It's urgent. Industry leaders are shouting it even louder. We're way behind. If we wait, we lose. But the rare earth bills? Permitting reform? Funding for large-scale mineral refining? Buried. It all gets sidelined in budget hearings or stalled in committee. Democrats have opposed fast-tracking U.S. mining projects, even if they're for clean energy or defense, because of environmental concerns. And right now, some of those lawmakers seem to think we've got more pressing issues to sort out in El Salvador. Meanwhile, Australia is stepping up. So is Vietnam. Even Greenland's on the list now. Because nothing says global crisis like considering an island of ice your backup supplier. 
Japan's hunting for deep sea minerals, Canada's building trade deals, everyone's whispering what if China cuts us off tomorrow and realizing, yeah, we might be screwed. There's also a push to recycle minerals from old electronics, which is a great idea if you know where your old flip phone from 2007 is. But make no mistake, the race is on. And so far, China is still lapping us. Investors are watching this mess like it's Shark Week, because when something essential becomes unstable, the money moves fast. Stocks like MP Materials have spiked. Mining ETFs like ReMX are getting attention. Any company tied to electric vehicles, defense tech, or battery storage is suddenly in the spotlight. Trump is calling for rare mineral refining plants to be built directly on U.S. military bases. No middlemen, no waiting on Congress, just make it happen. He triggered a Section 232 investigation to hit China with tariffs, if they keep undercutting us on critical minerals. He's also unlocking Defense Production Act funding and calling for a new mineral investment fund to get real money into U.S. mining and refining. Now not five years from now. This is what smart investors are paying attention to. There is a world of opportunity here. This is when we watch close and jump in early. It's also a good time to notice what lawmakers are focused on. Are they on the news, talking about one of America's most important issues or gang members? This isn't about being green, it's about being first. And if America can rebuild its own supply chain, if we can mine, refine and manufacture without depending on Beijing, there's a tidal wave of opportunity waiting on the other side. This is a sector shift tied to national survival. The minerals that power AI, EVs, missiles, and microchips, they are the new oil. And this time investors who move early might be the ones calling the shots later. This is about a lot more than just trade. It's not just about supply chains or tariffs. It's about independence. Every cable, every sensor, every satellite, we just can't power the modern world without these materials. And if we can't access them, well, we're done. We gave away the keys to our future without reading the fine print. Now it's time to take them back. Subscribe if you want more no-fluff breakdowns on what actually matters for America's economy and the future of your money. And drop a comment. Do you think we'll catch up, or are we just going to sit around and wait for China to pull the plug? Either way, we're already in the war. If China pulls the plug, the entire United States will be melting down like a teenager without their Wi-Fi. Only difference is, this tantrum shuts down factories, not Fortnite. China has hinted at doing it to show power, scare us and stay in control. So why haven't they? I'll answer that in part two, as soon as I finish writing it.